Hello and welcome. You're listening to the American Interest Podcast with me, Richard Aldous. My guest this week is David Reynolds, Cambridge professor and author of the new book, Island Stories, an unconventional history of Britain. Uh, David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Richard. Pleasure to be with you. So congratulations uh, on the new book. It's a historical work, of course, but the context is very much Brexit. Yes, it was prompted by Brexit and by the long arguments this country has had about being in and out of the European Union and if we wanted to be out, how we should get out. But what I was interested in was what this revealed about the way that the British people talk, think and talk about their past. And so the book is really about how the British have understood their history uh, in various ways. And one of the concerns I had was that there's a huge amount of, of comment and fascination with 1940, the year 1940, Winston Churchill, Our Finest Hour, Dunkirk and or the Battle of Britain. And I wanted to take a longer view of that. So it's a book that goes back over several centuries, indeed, in some cases, back to 1066, and looks at a variety of ways in which we've talked about our history as British people, particularly the themes of Europe, uh, empire, Britain, and our whole sense of identity as a country. And what I was also thinking is that this is not simply a story that is relevant to the British. It's also for many countries that have had a, uh, a proud past and are struggling a little bit to think where they're going in the future. So for a country like the United States, uh, that I think is a, a similar set of problems. Not, of course, the same in, in, in many respects as for the British, but nevertheless, this is a book, in a sense, about Britain, but for a, a wider than British audience. Yeah, I, as you say, Churchill looms over uh, British history and in some ways he looms over the, this entire book. Um, mm. And it, it, there's one sentence that really stands out where you talk about how, uh, in some ways, public history, British history in the public mind has narrowed to one man in, in one year. Mm. Um, it, I wondered about the balance of that, because, of course, in, in some ways, it's good that people are interested in history, uh, that they, they think about history, they think about uh, the way in which we connect with history. Mm. And yet there are also these dangers that inevitably we latch on to particular things and in some ways they crystallise as everything that, that history represents uh, for a particular country. Yes, I think so. Uh, I think it's true, obviously, uh, for the United States. There's obviously a tremendous sense of the importance of the founders in American history. And in recent times, of course, some unfamiliar founders like Alexander Hamilton have suddenly hit the the, the national uh, discussion in, uh, because of the musical. But I think the British have a particular focus with that moment in, 19, in 1940. Um, focused in on one man uh, who, of course, was a very, very important war leader, but also a very successful self-popularizer, promoter of himself through his six volumes of memoirs and through a whole lot of things that have come after them, books and films and so on. And I am I've written about Churchill. I'm I'm fascinated by Churchill. He was undoubtedly a major figure. But what concerns me is a sense that the history has become uh, uh, iconic. This man has turned into two dimensional figure, an icon on a wall rather than a very three dimensional, flawed, but totally remarkable person. And that for me is an example of what I am concerned about when history becomes heroic when it's about great men and it's usually about great men uh, who have been whose lives have been simplified so that they stand for us now as people to emulate which of course was a, a classical conception of, of why we should study history going back to Greece and Rome but it seems to me it's not proper history in the way I understand it as an academic historian. And I'm trying in this book to bridge the gap between academic study of history and the way it's being uh, history is being uh, relayed 
in the public culture. And I wonder, do you think that this is a, a new thing? When I when I look back to uh, when I was at uh, primary school, what uh, Americans would call elementary school, mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, four houses or teams. Uh, they were called Chichester, Churchill, Drake, and Nelson. These these mm. four kind of great seafaring uh, characters. So, uh, do you feel that there's something new going on, or is this something that you see stretching back and and to some degree uh, is a is a universal problem uh, for all countries across time? Yeah, I think there is a sense in which uh, particular individuals have been picked out uh, for uh, study and emulation and praise. And at the beginning of my book, uh, Island Stories, I mentioned the book, uh, which was called Our Island Story, which was published in the beginning of the 20th century and was essentially a series of children's tales about heroic figures in English history. And that's a book which has had a huge currency over the years. Indeed, it was held up by two conservative politicians, Michael Gove and David Cameron, the prime minister, as uh, the way to study our history. Um, and what I feel is that the professional study of history has changed so much now in the last 50 years from this account of great men and politics to bring in so many other themes which uh, academics know about, the themes of the study of, of gender, family, uh, cultural history, dress, clothes, food, how these should be fitted into our richer a tapestry of what history is about, yet the tendency of uh, the public discussion, and particularly by politicians, is to continue to uh, to uh, purvey this, this sense of a series of great figures who have shaped our past in a way that I think fails to pick out some of the deeper currents and more complex currents that we ought to study as historians. And that one of the things that you say is that, uh, to some degree, heritage has replaced history. Yes. Although I've said my book, I hope, is has, has something to be read and taken in by many other countries, one of the very distinctive things about U the UK, or England certainly, is the National Trust, which is, despite its title, a, a private organisation to conserve the landscape and the buildings of the past. And it started as a very laudable and important objective by the Victorians to save uh, parts of our past which were simply being overtaken by industrialization or, and development. It's now one of the major landowners in Britain. It has five million members uh, who support this and they keep up these places um, and many of them are wonderful places to visit, uh, the, the countryside, the facilities, the attempt to explain what life was like if you lived in a, a big country house. But in the process, I think that that sense of history, um, uh, that, that, that sense of the past has become dominant. In other words, that what we're talking about is this wonderful heritage of objects, places, scenery, and so on, again, avoiding a close analysis of the big picture story of how the country has changed. Because for me as a historian, I don't believe I'm thinking and I'm obsessed with the past per se in itself. What I'm interested in is in the di dimension of time, that we all as human beings live in time. And we need to understand the interrelationship between past and present and future. Uh, that's what I'm interested in, helping people to think about where they stand in the stream of time rather than latching on to golden ages in the past or great moments in the past that we should hang on to and cherish uh, forever. So, I mean, for for example, uh, how helpful do you think it is? We're going through the coronavirus as mm. well. Uh, one of your other books was about the First World War. Mm. Yeah, d d just w without necessarily asking you to go into the, the specifics, but, mm. you know, should we be thinking about the 1918-1919 flu pandemic as we think about the moment that we're going through now? There may be some... Um, uh, 
pointers in a loose way from a, an, a pandemic a century ago. Uh, but my worry is that there is a tendency to use to resort to history uh, for analogies to say this was done in the past at this moment. We should import that now. Lessons from the past that are sort of looking for analogies. So, for example, of course, in the, the Cold War, they were often adduced the lessons of appeasement in the 1930s, the dangers of, of going soft on dictators and then they'll just ask for more. My view of, of thinking of history is that idea of history as a way of, it's a way of thinking rather than a set of uh, analogies or examples from the past that we apply. And what I'm encouraging people to do with this book is say, OK, let's think about this country's present situation in the context of a long stream of history about, say, our relations with Europe over a series of centuries, going back to the 400 years in the medieval period where kings of England were also kings of parts of France, um, going back to periods in which the English Channel was not a barrier, but was a bridge between two sides of a, an Anglo-French kingdom. Let's think in this sort of way and see how things have evolved rather than saying, ah, yes, coronavirus, 1918 Spanish flu. What can we learn from that? Yeah, it's interesting that uh, quite a lot of what you're describing there, ironically, of course, is a Churchillian way uh, of thinking mm. that, that Churchill himself, you've written about this, um, that Churchill himself thought that trying to think like that, what uh, other historians have called thinking in time, mm. is, is, is a way that we should be thinking about the contemporary world. But Churchill, I think, picked out a sort a, a particular narrative, which for me is um, uh, limiting and prescriptive, too prescriptive for the kind of broad history we now do. So I think that uh, yes, I mean, he had he had a sense of the span of time, but it was very much what uh, w was known in the trade as the Whig a Whig view of history about the gradual evolution of English liberties. And it was pretty much an emphasis on England and on the wider England, the English speaking peoples, um, rather than a close and critical uh, investigation of our history. Churchill was a remarkable man. I mean, this is somebody who's a war leader and also a writer, uh, a prodigious writer. He earns his money from his pen. But he's not, I think, a guide for writing history in the way that um some might think if you simply say, well, Churchill was a historian. And it's one of the one of the themes that runs through the book is that you are often quite critical of those who've taken ch what we might describe as Churchillian ideas um, and spun them for political reasons. Uh, for example, uh, the notion of the of an, of an English speaking peoples, what uh, sometimes today is referred to as Anglosphere, yeah. uh, is, is something that uh, you have reservations about. Yes. Uh I mean, what I was trying, what I do in the book is that I'm, I'm looking for, I'm engaging with the question of how do we tell a big picture story about this country's development? And am I happy with, if you like, a simple Whig interpretation of this as the unfolding of, of liberties uh, leading to the mother of parliaments who is, you know, is is the uh, the envy of the world in terms of its political system, uh, or am I happy with the idea of an inexorable decline that Britain has followed eventually the path of the Roman Empire and so on? And um, what I do in each chapter is to begin with the way that certain politicians have tried to spin that long story. Some of them are people from the Brexit debate, people like Boris Johnson. Others are figures from the past, from an earlier past, not just, not, not just Churchill, but Margaret Thatcher, uh, Joseph Chamberlain, a politician of the early uh, 20th century. And I use those as a way of uh, starting us off 
and then perhaps interrogating some of those ideas and saying, well, are there views of Europe or Britain? Gordon Brown, the uh, uh, Labour politician I use for the beginning of the chapter on the identity of Britain and what is Britishness. Are these reasonable um, approaches? But one of the things that I also feel, since you could say I'm using these politicians um, as um, uh, as a target, is that it's really important to tell the big story. What concerns me about a lot of academic history now is that it is superb, but micro. In other words, it's very detailed. It, it looks at a tremendous range of sources that would have never been used in Churchill's day. But it's not really connecting up with the general public, not connecting the work up with wider concerns in the national culture. So a book like this, which in some ways is a bit crazy, you know, writing about a millennium of history in a relatively short compass, is intended to say, OK, I want to bring some of these ideas from recent scholarship into public debate. I'm going to offer some longer narratives about how Britain has engaged with Europe or how Britain came together over the centuries or how we made an empire, but the empire has also made us as a country. And then offer those for public discussion and uh, debate, because I think that's part of what academic historians should do. Yeah, one of those uh, larger debates, um, the one that you say at the beginning, in some ways, is the the thing that prompts the book in mm. the in the first place. Is this relationship with Europe? Mm. How do you how do you see that larger framework? And, and what's the what's the response to people who say, well, actually, continental Europe does have in that larger framework has a very different kind of history, different uh, systems of law, very mm. different culture that Britain has always been semi detached. And so maybe in some ways, uh, Brexit was was inevitable, uh, almost from the moment that Britain joined in 1973. Yes, well, clearly, there is there are distinctive features of Britain that stem from uh, it, its island nature, and also from the 16th century break with the Catholic Church, when Britain became, or England in England and Scotland initially became a haven for Protestantism uh, against an embattled uh, 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 continent where the Counter-Reformation was trying to roll back the, the Protestant Reformation. And that had an enduring effect on Britain's sense of identity. But what I also try and say in the book is, in that chapter, is that if you think of this in power political terms, most British governments of whatever persuasion over the centuries, certainly since the days of the Reformation, since the days of Queen Elizabeth, uh, but also I think it's true of the medieval kings, did not want power blocks to form on the continent, which could threaten to dominate the continent and potentially endanger Britain's trade and even Britain's security. In other words, threatening invasion. So that these high point familiar moments of our history, like the Spanish Armada or um, uh, Napoleon's uh, armies on the uh, on the beaches at uh, Boulogne, ready to invade or, or, or Hitler in 1940, they're part of this larger pattern of British foreign policy, which has always been to try and maintain some kind of balance of power on the continent of Europe. Ideally, through Britain's um, financial power, paying for others, if you like, to do the fighting, but in extremists fighting themselves. And, of course, most dramatically and uh, tragically in, in the terms of British history, in the First World War, where we lose three quarters of a million dead, which is uh, a, a total, uh, you know, has not been was, was unprecedented and hasn't been followed since in British history. So the costs could sometimes be high, but the policy was essentially the same. And what I argue in the case of the European Economic Community, as it then was in the 1950s, we decided to join it, not so much for economic reasons, but because we could not afford to have a block of six powerful countries, including France and West Germany, form on the continent and perhaps become the main focus for uh, the United States and its engagement with Europe. In other words, if that group took off, the six 
the European community took off, maybe our special relationship with America would be endangered. So it was better for us to be inside it than outside it. That, of course, implies, going back to your question, that, yes, we did see ourselves as somewhat separate or distinctive. But the rationale, I think, was uh, for joining was one that really had the same character as British foreign policy over many centuries. And if we think now of what's happening since we have formally left or started to leave the disentangle ourselves from the European Union, we will face those same problems in the future. And that is part of the challenge that Boris Johnson faces, though he is not willing to particularly uh, talk about it. And what about the uh, the Union uh, itself? Mm -hmm. You have a chapter on, on what it actually means to be British and how that's different uh, to being English. A lot, a lot of these questions um, are being rehearsed during the, the kind of the Brexit, Absolutely. the Brexit debate. Um, Ireland in particular has, has been at the centre at a lot of those discussions. So in the in, in 2020, what does it actually mean to be British? Not clear. Not clear. It's not clear that it's ever been clear. Um, apart from, I think, a period of the after the Anglo-Scottish Union in 1707, where for a century, England and Wales joined with Scotland, forming uh, uh, Great Britain. Um, uh, there was then a sense of, you know, a, pro a common project, which I think was really the empire. Um, that the British, the English and the Scots engaged in. The Scots, uh, as as you well know, played a, uh, a, 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 dis a very considerable part in the uh, conquest and running of, of the empire. After 1801, when you add Ireland in, it becomes problematic. The Irish are not British. In the end, a certain part of, of Ireland has remained British, though with a rather embattled and distinctive sense of its own identity. So the, my account of the of the United Kingdom, if you want to put it this way, is one is a story basically of the expansionary impulses of English medieval kings carried on by their successors to control the island uh, Britain is on and the other island of Ireland. And that, that has been a story, if you like, of empire building on a small scale. At certain times, the empire has worked. I think it did for the Anglo-Scottish Union. and On the whole, I think it probably still does. It never worked for Ireland. By the uh, and of course, in uh, the First World War, Ireland split uh, it asunder by the the uh, the, the um, War of Independence, the Civil War and so on into Northern Ireland, staying with Britain and the Republic of Ireland as it became. For me, one of the important parts of the Brexit story coming closer to the present day is the 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 really important change at the very end of the 20th century in the 1990s, which was not sufficiently grasped, I think, by London politicians during the Brexit debate, namely that you had the Good Friday Agreement, which brought to an end the troubles in Northern Ireland and created a new relationship between Belfast and Dublin uh, and London, which opened up the Irish border, opened up commerce and contact across the island of Ireland in a very hopeful way. Plus the fact that uh, Tony Blair's government, uh, uh, after a referenda, created devolved governments in Edinburgh and Cardiff, in other words, for the Scots and the Welsh, which have gradually gained more power. And it seems to me that that was a long delayed, much necessary sort of loosening up of the joints of this uh, United Kingdom to make it to give everybody a bit more wriggle room uh, to change and expand and develop. Because of the failure to think through the UK dimension of Brexit by essentially English and home counties, in other words, London based politicians, uh, of whom Boris Johnson figures particularly, we ended up with a very problematic situation with regard to Ireland, 
which has been temporarily resolved by Johnson conceding a border, a customs border in the Irish Sea, though he keeps denying he's really done that. And also a problematic relationship with Scotland because the Scots voted to stay in the European Union, though constitutionally doesn't matter because it's a vote of the United Kingdom as a whole. But in political terms, it does matter because you've now got an acute tension between London and Edinburgh, between the two really most savvy politicians in the UK at the moment, uh, Boris Johnson and Nicola Sturgeon. And that's a crisis that is brewing. It's going to take time to brew, but it's also there. So the future, uh, the, the question, I think, is that in breaking out of one union, the European Union, is there going to be a breakup of the other union, the United Kingdom? And that's an issue, I think, that is going to be very interesting in the future. Yeah, I wonder, you mentioned uh, Boris Johnson there. I wonder what you make of him. He is somebody uh, who has always been very interested in history. He's he's written on Churchill. He studied classics. Um, and he does seem to have um, at least very good political, electoral uh, instincts, winning the leadership of the Conservative Party and then winning a thumping majority mm. at the at, at the last election. Um, so, so what's what's your take on on the British Prime Minister? A uh, brilliantly successful politician. Um, the election victory was uh, historic in every way uh, to get that majority. Uh, Johnson, I think, is as many people who've worked with him would say, he is a, if you like, he's a showman politician. He is much better at performance. Uh, he has this incredible gift for making even people who are critical of him smile. You know, he has this this performance manner. So in the last, in the election campaign, he basically said very little and went around doing. Um, visiting places and almost dressing up in in particular you know uniforms so he'd visit a um a a, 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 a fishery town and he'd dress up in a, a fishmonger's outfit or he'd um he'd uh, go and visit a factory and he'd you know drive a jcb digger or something like this and everybody laughed it was great fun it only works because he has got a, a, a very savvy politically um, strategic team uh, of whom the most fig famous person is or notorious person is Dominic Cummings, depending on how you think of him. But he's got some other important advisors, Edward Lister, for example. They are basically, if you like, the strategic brains behind the operation. So it's at the moment it works in that sort of sense. Um, Johnson was never uh, a convinced Brexiteer. There are a lot of people in British politics, including someone like Nigel Farage, for example, who have been committed to getting out of the European Union for a long time. Johnson, it's fairly clear, was un indecisive uh, in 2015 into 2016, decided that it actually was more, frankly, politically opportunist, but advantageous to go with the Leave campaign and pick up the support of a whole lot of people in the Tory party who were Eurosceptic. And he's now ridden, ridden with that. He's gone with that. And his whole political strategy is to make a success of Brexit and use that as a platform for all sorts of other initiatives, many of which he hasn't really thought through himself. So brilliant politician, showman, uh, not clear if he's really thought through where he's going. And that remarkable ability, I mean, putting politics to one side to to make the political weather, either as a conservative mayor of yep. London, as you say, essential in the in the Brexit referendum in 2016, uh, winning this, in your words, historic uh, yep. election victory at the, at the end of 2019, uh, that even uh, looking, I suppose, in, in 50 years time, there's not going to be very much doubt that uh, historians are going to be looking at Boris Johnson and, and reading trying to, to work out what was going on there because he will be a major figure. Yeah, absolutely. And he made the weather. If you think of his predecessor, Theresa May, will anybody be talking about her in five years time? I mean, a, I think in many ways, a very sad story, but she wanted to be prime minister. But what she lacked was that gift for 
relating to people, conveying ideas, sparking uh, debate and so on um, that Johnson has. So final question, David, the hard one. What will Britain's Ireland story look like in, say, 50 years time? I I do not think I think that the the United Kingdom may not exist in the present form. Uh, I, I think there will might well be uh, a development towards a uh, a united or confederal kind of Ireland in some more form. Whether Scotland remains in the, in the Union, I don't know. It's not viable as far as I can see at the moment, but it's it's clearly unhappy. A lot of Scots are unhappy within the Union as it presently forms. So if it's going to survive, the Union's got to be a lot more, a lot looser. The other thing that interests me, we haven't talked about so much, is the changing face of Britain uh, in the same way as there is a changing face, if you like, of America. By the uh, before 2050, uh, uh, the Caucasians will be a minority in the US population. In other words, the face of America 2050 is not Trump, it's Obama. Uh, the blending of different races, as you know, the the old-fashioned term. In in, in Britain, it will be less less uh, pronounced. Maybe a quarter of the population will be mixed race, but that has a big effect on the notions of British identity, or it should do. What I'm concerned about in Britain, as I think people are in the United States, is whether attitudes are moving in at the same pace as identity, the the de- demographic identity of the country is changing. And that's part of why that last chapter, the last major chapter of the book is about empire and this idea that the world we thought we'd made in our own image through the empire is actually now coming back to reshape us in some ways problematically, in other ways, very positively and interestingly. And that, I think, is the other side of this story about change, which we need to watch in the future. Yes, I'd I'd said last question, but I do want to to quickly follow up on that, because, you know, maybe in some ways, do you think that a a lot of that changing identity is rooted uh, in what used to be the empire, a a lot of um, uh, immigration from in the post-war period, which had come from the West Indies, which came from the Indian subcontinent. So in, in some ways, do you think that this is kind of part of the effect of actually Britain, to use the phrase that many use, that they do want it to be a global Britain, that maybe the attachment to Europe is less, the attachment to the world, because the attachment to the world is stronger? Uh, except that the identity of many of these people uh, is in many ways British. They embrace the whole story. I mean, if you start whether people came, if you like, as refugees from uh, uh, Uganda nations who were refugees from Idi Amin's regime, their children are growing up as British as I am in terms of their legal position, course, yeah. born in the country, thinking of it interested in their sense of British heritage and, you know, where the family came from globally. And I've got students, you know, in our first year here at Cambridge, uh, in my college, who are, who are like that. And I've talked to them about their sense of identity. So I don't think they necessarily feel themselves as being global in that sort of way. Um, and also, I think proximity matters. Whatever is said about global Britain, and it's at the moment more of a government slogan than it's a reality, the continent of Europe remains our major trading partner. It, it, it's, an, it's, it's a part of the world which we are physically, ge- geographically closest to, and we cannot get right any new global policy if we have a problematic relationship with the European Union. That's got to be made to work. That, I think, has to be foundational. So in that sense, we have to be a European country first, whatever else we do beyond that. So the book is Island Stories, an unconventional history of Britain. It's written by my guest, David Reynolds, and published by Basic Books, price $30. Uh, but for now, David, it's such a pleasure. Congratulations again, and thanks for joining us on the American Interest Podcast. Thanks, Richard.
So that's it from us this week. Don't forget to check our website, theamericaninterest.com, and to subscribe to the show on your podcast app. Now, the show is produced by Demir Marusik with Sean Keady. Do join us again next time. But for now, this is me, Richard Alder, saying thanks for listening. Thank you.